Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to Strengthening Caregiving, uh, caregiving Environment um, session today. Thank you very much for joining. We will be having very interesting discussion, I hope at least, and um, yeah, let's uh, get started. So my name is Christine Mikhailizi, and uh, I will be facilitating this session today. I'm from Bolt Vision International. And first of all, let me introduce our great speakers today. Um, so we will have um, three um, wonderful presenters. We will start with Sophia Backhaus. Uh, Sophia is a doctor of philosophy, student in social interventions at the University of Oxford, Center for Evidence-Based Interventions. Sophia holds Masters of um, Science in Psychology from the University of uh, Constance, Germany. In her professional life, Sophia has worked as a consultant in the World Health Organization, led a cross-national research project on political violence at the University of Haifa. And as her first profession, she worked as a preschool teacher around the world. So she will be with us as a first presenter. Our second presenter today will be Clemence Quint, Clemens is a social and behavior change expert and the co-founder of Magenta. Magenta is an organization dedicated to leveraging social and behavior science to improve the life of the most vulnerable. <laughs> Over the past few years, Clemens has worked with um, UNICEF extensively and she used social and behavior change approaches to prevent violence against children. Another interesting presentation will come from Clemens. And our third presenter today will be Flora Cohen. And she is a research manager with Transcultural Psychosocial Organization Uganda. Flora is pursuing her doctoral degree in social work from Washington University in St. Louis. She has over 10 years of experience supporting the mental health and well being of vulnerable populations, including mixed method research that seeks to understand psychosocial well-being and support for displaced people in low resource settings. Um, prior to academia, Flora also practiced clinical social work through the provision of trauma-informed therapy, such as child parent therapy to parents of children under five. So you can see you have great team of presenters and they will be presenting the following. So Sophia will talk about parenting interventions in humanitarian settings. She will present a systematic review and meta-analysis, and we will think, are we reducing child mal maltreatment actually or not? Uh, Clemence will introduce an innovative parenting program in Tunisia called P+. And Flora uh, will walk us through a uh, caregiver um, uh, psychosocial uh, programming and prevention of harm to children. So this um, three interesting uh, presentations we will hear today. Before I give a floor to our presenters, let me first invite you all to participate in a um, poll question. So in your um, chat box, you see the um, you will see now the link to a Mentimeter poll. Please follow the link and um, help us to understand um, where are you coming from and what is your background. Very simple question, questions. And the first question is, which statement describe you the best? Hope you can all see um, the Mentimeter questions. Yes, we can start. Sorry, seeing. is it sharing the Mentimeter? Not yet. On the screen? Not yet. No, okay, sorry. Give me two seconds and I'll be getting it up. Apologies for that. Of course. And still, I hope you can see the Mentimeter questions. Um, on your screens and you can answer the questions that are coming. So the first question is, which statement describe you best, you, you the best? 
I am a child prote protection practitioner. I am a practitioner coming from a different sector than child protection. I am an academic. I am a government worker. I am a student. Sorry, is it up on the screen now? Not yet, dear Kat. That is, I'm so sorry. It's giving me some trouble. Sorry about that. Give me two moments. Yes, of course. We love technology. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. The joy of COVID worked by. Let us know, Kat, if it is a big issue, then we can maybe skip that part. Yes, I'm so sorry. I won't be able to share just for this moment. Um, my computer seems to have not liked me sharing the slides previously and is now upset with me. Um, but if you don't mind moving forward, I can always share it afterwards once I get it sorted. Of course. Um, so maybe you can see the results and you can just share with us what the results are. Yes, of course I can. Give me two seconds here. Um, so for which statement describes you best? Um, the largest one is I am a child protection practitioner that got um, almost, uh, I would say the majority of the responses. We do also have a few people that are joining that are students um, and academic. Um, as well as one person who's a pre practitioner coming from a different sector than the CP sector. Amazing. So we have a group of people who will be um, highly involved in the conversation about uh, caregiving, uh, caregivers environments. Amazing. Thank you very much. And um, do you see the answers for the second questions? Um, so, be, uh, mm -hmm. so everyone will just have to either click the same link again if they've exited out or you'll now see that the second question is now live. Um, so please do. Um, wonderful. Julie has come to save the day. <laughs> um, Thank Julie, you. <laughs> if you could please switch to the second question, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Yes. And in uh, on our screen, we can see the answers coming through for the question, how familiar are you with parenting programs? Um, and we can see people somewhat familiar, as well as um, very familiar and not familiar at all. But we will have wonderful discussions. And I think we can all engage and share um, the practices and experiences that we all have. Amazing. Thank you very much. And um, probably we can move to the last question, please. How familiar you are with the prevention interventions for child protection programming? Please choose what um, works for you with this question. Oh, look at this, amazing. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so we can see that we have people who have experience with application of prevention intervention in practice. We also have uh, people with theoretical knowledge, which is very good. Great, so we can have an expert um, conversation today. And um, as I said, share experiences and our, our perspectives. Thank you very much. Thank you for helping us to understand um, our group um, today. And um, I would like us not to delay further, and I would like to invite Sophia to start sharing with us. Sophia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can you just nod and confirm that you do see my share? Perfect, all right. 
Um, so first of all, um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. I don't know where you are around the world. Um, my name is Sophia Backhaus. I'm a doctoral researcher, which is a PhD student at the University of Oxford at the Center for Evidence-Based um, uh, Interventions. And um, I would like to present on a project um, which I conducted with my supervisor, Professor Francis Gardner, in collaboration with the World Health Organization. So in this project, we want to know whether parenting interventions that are delivered in humanitarian settings in low and middle income countries can reduce child maltreatment. I just want to stop and say I'm really actually delighted that there are so many people who are practitioners on this call because coming as a researcher, I think this dialogue is super important and I can learn probably as much from you than you can hopefully learn a bit from this presentation. So I'm really looking forward towards this engagement. So first of all, what are parenting interventions? Um, parenting interventions show parents new ways to interact with their children. We know that changing knowledge and attitudes is not enough. So just telling parents about maybe the um, development of children or child rights is often not enough, but we need to change the behaviors, especially those that can be harmful to children. This can be quite hard, especially for families that are living in really stressful situations, such as, for example, humanitarian settings. And activities included in these parenting interventions are, for example, discussions between parents. So often parents meet in a group or you have individual coaching as a parent with maybe a psychologist or a trained facilitator can be in the form of lectures, which is more rarely, um, and often we use forms of modeling. So for example, um, there are role play situations where maybe one parent plays the role of the child and then another parent plays the role of the parent. And these parents are then taught different ways how to uh, react to what's maybe um, stressful behaviors uh, displayed by the child. The most essential and key is that parents really have the opportunity to practice these new behaviors. So just hearing about them is not really enough. You, they need ways to reflect on it, to discuss and refine those um, parenting behaviors. So historically, these parenting interventions were often developed to reduce child conduct problems, which is, for example, uh, one may say something like a naughty child or a child with uh, very aggressive behaviors or ADHD symptoms. Often these parents of those children were invited to participate in parenting interventions. And we know that changing child behaviors often works through parenting by showing them the parents ways of um, effectively disciplining children or um, ignoring negative behaviors and rewarding instead the positive ones. So every change goes through parenting, but it was often more the secondary focus of these interventions and also the research that focused on the effectiveness of these interventions. Specifically in the past decade, probably, the focus went a bit back towards the parenting behavior, specifically the behavior that is on the spectrum of child maltreatment. So parenting interventions, do they have an effect on harsh, abusive parenting behaviors? This is a child protection conference, so I do not think I need to talk too much about child maltreatment and its definition. But what I would like to stress here is when I'm now moving forward in this presentation, talk about child maltreatment, I exclude sexual abuse. This is because sexual abuse often is different in terms of the perpetrators, but also the motivation. And this is often not targeted nor addressed in a parenting intervention. There are some parenting interventions that look at sexual abuse, but it's not the main focus. Instead, we, in parenting interventions, we look at behaviors such as um, physical disciplining, like shaking, spanking a child, emotional abuse, such as insulting a child, or neglectful behaviors. We know that parenting in humanitarian settings is a bit more challenging. So these children really largely depend on the, their parents and caregivers but unfortunately, what we found in research, not me, but other um, really brilliant researchers, they found that war-exposed parents showed less warmth and more harshness towards these children. So even though these parents want to be amazing parents towards their children, but sometimes they may carry 
more um, distress and psychos uh, psychosomatic or psychological symptoms that doesn't enable them to, to be the best they can. And parenting interventions themselves can be effective for families that live in adversity. As we've seen in research, um, for example, with families living in extreme poverty, or for example, with families that live in uh, areas which really high rates, or high rates of HIV. We also know that psychosocial interventions themselves work in humanitarian settings. Um, but these previous reviews that looked at those interventions, only a few parenting interventions were included. So there is a need to really know whether these interventions do work for um, in this setting, in humanitarian settings, in low and middle income countries to reduce child maltreatment. So this work, as I've previously mentioned, is part of the WHO guideline development process. So I'm pretty sure that most of you know the INSPIRE framework, the seven strategies for ending violence against children, which was developed by WHO, UNICEF, and a lot, another um, amount of large stakeholders. And one of these strategies is parent and caregiver support. And as Santi previously already mentioned, it's not necessarily only parent training that is a form of parent and caregiver support, but one form could be parenting interventions. And the WHO acknowledges this by currently developing guidelines on parenting to prevent child maltreatment and promote positive development in children. So, uh, oh, sorry, is someone asking a question? Gracias. Okay, I just continue. So um, we are part, so me and my team, we are part um, of this WHO guideline development process by bringing the evidence to the WHO and the guideline development group. Based on that, they can then inform some um, recommendations and the guidelines. So since not everybody is an academic, I just wanna talk a bit about the method of systematic review. So what you see here is a pyramid of evidence. So the higher it goes in the pyramid, you see the lower the risk of bias, but also the more generalizable is the evidence out there. So on the top, you see systematic reviews. So systematic reviews systematically review and summarize the evidence out there. So it may be that one study finds, oh, a parenting intervention is effective in reducing physical abuse. But another study in a different context maybe finds no effect of this intervention on any outcomes. So what we need to know is on average, do these interventions work, yes or no? And of course, what you feed into this review really affects the outcome of the review. So we really want really good studies. And one of the more rigorous forms of individual studies are randomized controlled trials, which you see here in orange, or RCTs or trials. So basically, this is an experiment in the field. And if you remember, in an experiment, you randomly assign participants either to an intervention or experimental group or to a control group. So in this case, it could be parents that are either randomly assigned to an intervention group, a parenting intervention, or to a control group that doesn't receive anything. And then after time has passed, after the participants in the intervention group went through the intervention, you go back to these two groups of parents, interview them or measure forms of their behaviors. And then you can compare afterwards, which we uh, call post-test, whether there's a difference between the intervention group and the control group. So did the intervention make any difference? So in this systematic view we conducted, we really had a very rigorous search. So we searched over 26 academic databases. But we know that not every study that is conducted, especially studies from low and middle income countries, necessarily end up in academic publications. So we don't want to be biased to that. So we looked at gray literature, which could be, for example, um, a report by an international organization or by an NGO. And we also searched in a multitude of languages. So we did not only search in English. As an outcome of this search, we had 75,000 abstracts and titles we had to screen and see which one are eligible for our review. So which ones are really parenting interventions and which are really 
randomized controlled trials, et cetera, et cetera. We then, when we had the final list of studies, we extracted just basic information, for example, the participants, so what type of parents were involved, how old were the children, um, which humanitarian setting was it, what type of interventions were included, and of course, which outcomes were measured at post-test, so after the intervention was conducted. And then in our meta-analysis, which is basically the statistical assessment of this review, we estimated the average effect across all these trials. So this is what we found. So we found a total of 18 parenting intervention trials in 14 different countries. And the humanitarian settings that were largely included were post-conflict. We had a few studies that measured, uh, that included refugee parents, uh, followed by parents in war or conflict zones, such as, for example, the DRC or Palestine, and one study in the natural disaster setting. So this was one study from Nepal after an earthquake. This is now a bit clumsy maybe, but this is a total list of the studies included. So you see the first author in the year, but you see the country, which I think is quite interesting for most of you, where these studies were conducted. And on the very right hand side, you see the name of the intervention. And since you are all practitioners, you may recognize some of those names of intervention programs. So these have been evaluated in those settings. So what did we find? So when we now looked post-test, so after the intervention, is there on average a difference between the intervention group and the control group of parents on child maltreatment? We did not find a significant effect. On average, yes, we found a decrease, but this was not significant. What this means is that there is a chance that this is purely based on luck, that there's a difference. However, what we found is, and I think this is really promising, we did find a decrease on harsh parenting. And harsh parenting, in our definition, also included child maltreatment. So it not only included child maltreatment as measured by child maltreatment instruments, but also behaviors that are somehow close to child maltreatment, such as corporal punishment, authoritative parenting, and so on. Going one layer further, we also found a decrease in negative parenting. So here we include child maltreatment, harsh parenting, but also other maybe ineffective ways of parenting, such as ineffective behavior management, maybe uh, spend, uh, putting a lot of attention towards negative child behaviors instead of ignoring them, um, or overprotective parenting, and so on. We also found an increase um, in positive parenting, such as warmth or uh, responsiveness with very young children and stimulation, um, which is a bit not really in line with previous research findings is that we did not find any effects for child behavior problems and parent mental health. There may be a multitude of reasons for this. So we could not find a decrease in, for example, um, anxious, withdrawn child behaviors or very aggressive child behaviors or delinquent. This may be that these interventions that are delivered in humanitarian settings, and I would love to have your thoughts on this because this is really hypothetical, it may be that these interventions um, don't really focus on this typical form of parenting, which is often delivered in a lot of high income countries, such as um, effective behavior management. What do I do if my child um, calls 10 times, mama, mama, mama? So what do I do out of this, for example? Um, but maybe I have another focus, maybe more on child uh, mental health um, concerns. And also we didn't find anything for parent mental health and the parents that are involved in parenting interventions and humanitarian settings often already come with high mental health problems. It may be, and this is again hypothetical, that a parenting intervention is just not enough for those parents. The threshold of helping these parents in their mental health by only a parenting intervention may not work. It, they may need something else. But this is not based on research. This is just a hypothetical explanation of the no effects here. So I want to conclude with some cautious conclusions and implications here. So first of all, we found a total of 18 
intervention studies for um, uh, delivered in humanitarian contexts in low mid income countries. This is a lot compared to the past years. And if you remember in the table I showed you, the year of publication, a lot of studies came from 2020. So there is a, um, a rise in uh, more interest in studies in these settings. We also see that parenting interventions in humanitarian settings can reduce harsh parenting, which includes abusive parenting. It can improve um, positive parenting and reduce overall negative parenting. However, we did not find any evidence for reduction of child maltreatment itself, child behavior problems, and parental health. We really need more research to unpack this, to understand why this is the case. Because individual studies do show partly reductions or improvements of certain symptoms, but just not on average. We are also unclear about differential effects. What this means is we don't know if there are certain families which may have less benefit or more benefit from this intervention. For example, it may be that um, interventions work specifically uh, wonderful for parents which are refugees, but not for parents um, who experience, for example, natural disaster, very hypothetical. Or um, maybe if it's delivered as a primary prevention, but not tertiary prevention, and so on and so on. Overall, there are still too few trials. We really need more trials to unpack these findings more. This, these findings are based on 18 trials, which is great, but it's just not enough to really unpack all of these effects. So we do need more studies, specifically studies that also include measures of child protection. And this is quite new in the field of parenting intervention still. It is, as I said, historically, is a main focus on child behavior problems. And in this review, out of these 18 studies, only six measured some form of child maltreatment, with only one study measuring the effects of the intervention on neglect. So it has to be more in focus of parenting trialists to understand the real effects. Thank you very much, as I said, it's, it's wonderful to have so many people on this call who have so many insights from the field. Um, please do not hesitate to contact me if there's any questions. Uh, please put the questions in the chat for Q&A otherwise. And yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Sophia. Um, amazing. Yeah, very interesting uh, systematic review and very important um, focus on how we use data actually and how we plan next uh, uh, intervention cycle on and make the informed decisions based on the data and yes of course we need to do more we need to uh, unpack all these aspects as you mentioned and um, uh, let's discuss further uh, as Sophia mentioned please start um, uh, putting your questions and we will have um, you know, time at the end after um, all our presenters uh, share with you we will have time for question and answers and we can discuss uh, further some issues that um, Sophia presented and other um, you know, two presenters will be sharing thank you very much Sophia and we will come back to you by the end of our session so now let me invite Clemens, please um, yeah, come and share with us Clemens uh, about P plus intervention in Tunisia. The floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, let me just share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Great. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for, for being here today. Um, it's, it's really exciting to be able to present um, some of the work we've been doing in, in Tunisia to you guys. Um, I think, first of all, let me, let me say it's, uh, it's quite interesting to be, to be here uh, amongst so many child protection practitioners. Um, myself uh, not being a child protection practitioner, uh, full disclosure. Um, I actually, I'm um, a social and behavioral change specialist. Yes. Um, so, and, sorry, someone's speaking. Um, and so I usually, 
I do a lot of work around, around child protection, but really from a, um, a trying to understand how social and behavioral change approaches um, can play a role to do, uh, in protection um, for children. Um, so really for us, prevention is really at the core of what we do, because I don't really look at uh, child protection from a creative perspective. We don't really do case management as an organization. Um, we really look at address prevention per se. Um, and so I just wanted to talk you guys through um, one of the parenting intervention that we've been piloting in Tunisia um, with a strong focus on, on child protection. Um, and I think Sophia laid out uh, the ground quite brilliantly um, for, for the case studies I'm, I'm about to walk you through, um, especially by, by defining what are parenting interventions um, and how those can be helpful in improving um, children's outcomes. Um, I also want to mention as a, as a, as a starting point that all of this work we've been uh, doing very closely with uh, both with UNICEF, with our funder on this, uh, but also with the Tunisian um, government um, and with local communities. And I think um, someone during the plenary session was mentioning um, the importance for the community to see themselves as more facilitators um, rather than implementers. Uh, and that's very much the approach we've tried uh, to take uh, throughout this whole, this whole pilot uh, piloting and, and modeling of, uh, of programs. Um, and so this year really we're focusing on, on primary prevention um, and really we feel like early childhood development and parenting uh, programs um, are a great starting point to, to prevention. Um, it's actually early enough in uh, a child's uh, life uh, and that's where they also that's where parents start modeling up their, their behaviors. Um, so, and it also help us look at prevention from a holistic um, manner, which I'll touch on um, throughout the case study, um, where we're really trying to, to look at touch points um, throughout different sectors uh, and really have a, a more um, cross-cutting approach. Uh, rather than a purely sectoral approach with uh, social protection. Um, so I just wanted to kind of like take a step back of, of where we started. Um, we basically were looking at um, very weak early childhood development indicators in Tunisia. Um, and those were challenged to the development of, of the state uh, and a major concern for the government. Um, and obviously a challenge to the accomplishment of, of children's rights in, in Tunisia. Um, a few indicators um, we'd been we'd been looking at. Um, we had only we had very low rate of, of breastfeedings. Um, we had massive nutrition issues, um, but we also had ninety three percent of Tunisian children uh, who are regularly exposed uh, to some form of violence in their own home, um, and very often uh, from from the discipline um, perspective. So what we ended up doing, so all of this data came from um, a mixed survey that was run by, uh, by the Tunisian government and UNICEF, uh, and then a full-on CAP survey trying to look at parenting practices. Um, we took all of this data um, and we looked at trying to understand and diagnose uh, the behavioral barriers, but also the enablers uh, to parenting practices that were impacting children's development outcomes um, to design a program that would feed into the Tunisian government um, early childhood development strategy um, and also work uh, with uh, UNICEF's in-country um, objective. Um, so the Tunisian government had just developed a early childhood um, development strategy spanning from 2017 to 2025. Uh, and one of their big angle, uh, something that they had diagnosed as one of the issues was how to better support new parents. Um, so one of the thing, um, one of the first thing we found um, was really that um, parents in Tunisia had a fairly no, low knowledge of early childhood development um, and that their own self-efficacy, so their perceived ability to adopt those behaviors was, was extremely low. Um, we also found that the community and the social environment, both real and 
the virtual, um, are in the media, the digital space, were not really conducive to the adoption of, of responsive parenting practices. Um, and there was a governance issue, uh, both for the Tunisian government and its partners, um, in terms of the service delivery model at the national and local level. Um, so we tried to flip all of this um, and we're looking at changing the three uh, components to make sure that Tunisian parents um, adopt behavior that promotes cognitive, physical, emotional and social well-being and development of their, of their children. Um, I just wanted to give a quick overview because this was a very um, a fairly long, fairly uh, participatory process and we're still at the end of it, uh, so we don't really have yet all of the evaluation data, um, but we can share that as soon as it's ready. Um, so we spent quite a long time uh, designing with, uh, with the government and local partners in Tunisia. Um, then even more time looking at the preparation of the rollout. And I think here one of the important uh, lessons learned uh, and experience sharing that I'd like to emphasize on and, and maybe have your thoughts on later on is, is the impact of COVID-19 on running out those interventions. Um, and then we, we've just finalized running out uh, the, the pilot uh, and we'll be looking at scale up plan uh, in, in, the past, in the next three months. So just to kind of like look at the program design, um, what we've been looking at is really putting parenting at the heart of our approach of early, on early child development with a massive focus on protection. Um, so the, the little logo you see on the right hand side of the screen is actually uh, the logo of the Ministry of uh, Social Affairs, which is responsible for protection. Um, because the idea with the approach was cross-sectoral, so we had 11 ministries included. Um, and, but throughout all of those touch points, we actually looked at protection um, and how could we improve prevention of um, violence to towards children. We and then made sure that the uh, program was as holistic and participatory as possible. And I think in the plenary sessions earlier, people were, were talking about this idea of looking at um, impacting throughout the different layers of the social ecological model, um, which is very much what we were trying to do. Uh, so here at the center, you've got our parents of children aged zero to five, which are obviously our primary uh, target audience and beneficiaries, right? But then we wanted to do was also work with our community leaders, with civil society, um, with the professionals of around health, education, protection, but also with the media and private sectors and with all of the government stakeholders. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time actually identifying different pilot sites uh, to set up our interventions um, and making sure that they were representative of different intervention domains. Um, and then we basically um, also worked with the community to select lead structures in each um, in each area. So that range from a clinic in the greater Tunis to a religious preschool in the southern southern Tunisia. Um, but so then, what do we actually do in all of those four pilot sites uh, at a national level? Um, so the first angle was looking at improving ECD service delivery. Um, and why was that? This was basically to look at improving parents' um, self-efficacy, uh, but also to have a more conducive um, environment for protection. Um, so we've looked at, um, we adapted uh, two uh, ECD training curricula. Um, the first one is a careful child development one, uh, which was um, developed by UNICEF. Uh, and has been rolled out in, I think, over 30 countries. It's a very uh, well-evidenced uh, curriculum uh, for ECD practitioners, uh, especially in the health sector. Um, and then the second curriculum, we looked at adapting with the Families Make the Difference curriculum, um, which was developed by ours, IRC um, for parents and caregivers, and which is much more focused on um, early stimulation and protection. Um, this, this was a fairly, a fairly long process where we worked with uh, communities um, across the countries. Uh, we did uh, quite a lot of, um, of testing and translating into local Arabic. Um, we have just finalized all of the uh, refresher trainings for CCD uh, and are finalizing the last batch of parents that were training on the Families Make the Difference curriculum. Um, a big part of this was done remotely and we had to set up uh, tools and guidance uh, that allowed uh, professionals and parents uh, to do self-learning as well 
so we'd be happy to share to share those with anyone um, who'd, who'd want. Um, with the idea of really getting ECD practitioners better able to observe and engage on parental practices and give advice on nurturing care. Um, and then we wanted our parent community leaders to be able to facilitate those parenting groups, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit more later. Um, so then that's what we did with the FMD, Families Make a Difference. We, we created local parenting support networks throughout the country. Um, initially, our team trained 18 parents on the, on the curriculum to become parenting groups and playgroup facilitators. Um, and, each, and then we created also those playgroup guides uh, to set up and run your local playgroups, including a little toolbox with activity uh, ideas. Um, so those are just uh, being finalized, uh, being launched throughout the countries. And some of them are being run by men, by father, and some of them are being run by women. Um, we've tried a huge lot to make sure that all of our programming was uh, fairly um, appealing to both men and women to ensure that we had father fully engaged throughout as well. Um, to make sure that parents were engaged uh, in the in the play groups, um, which very honestly, but extremely challenging in time of COVID as well. Um, we provided them with a lot of tools, um, including uh, some content we had uh, done in Lebanon, actually, uh, based on the, on the Family Make the Difference curriculum, uh, but also the, the booklets that were developed by the NGO called Think Equal uh, that we adapted to the Tunisian context, uh, which is a series of, of children's books to support social emotional development um, and strengthen uh, caregiver children relationship. Um, so those have been distributed on all of the sites. Um, and then I wanted to basically show you very quickly a, uh, actually it's in Arabic, so I'll just get the sound, uh, a little video of, of some of the activities um, of the toolbox. So where basically we provided all of this um, guidebooks for father to basically be able to um, play with their kids, uh, and um, and create their own their own activities. Uh, so it's a little testimonials of of that. Um, finally, we also created we um, as you remember we were looking at the conducive environment also from a virtual perspective, making sure that um, in the digital media space tools were available for our parents, uh, but that also you had. Um, an environment that could allow sparking discussions. Uh, so we also created a whole, a whole website and an app, both for parents and professional, um, to have access to information through a centralized resource library, uh, but also to be able to like uh, share questions and experiences as an online forum uh, for the professionals. Uh, it's also going to be a platform where they can actually have access to all of the training materials and online courses. Um, and it's all in, in French and in Arabic to make sure it's accessible uh, to most people because we found out parents, I mean, parents are more comfortable in Arabic, but professionals tend to be trained in French. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure that it was um, accessible to, to everyone. Um, we created a lot of content. We tried to make it really fun and engaging and quite different from your traditional kind of like ECD and parenting programming. Um, again, to make sure that we appeal not only to uh, young mothers, but to everyone in, in the family. Um, there's a bit of uh, informational content as well. Um, and then um, we also looked at training uh, local C4D communications for development champions in each of our pilot sites um, to make sure that they could develop their own communications and outreach plan at the local level. Um, we've supported also a whole nationwide um, awareness raising campaign are still going on. Um, and we're about to release also a um, TV reality show that is looking really at promoting responsive parenting practices. Um, this is inspired by, by Super Nani, uh, who is actually originally uh, Tunisian, as I've learned through working through this program in Tunisia. Um, where we basically we went to spend time with uh, families throughout the countries, uh, with, a Tuni with Tunisian um, early childhood development experts uh, that were kind of like observing and learning about the challenges they were facing in the families, um, giving them advice. And then a few months later, um, we came back and had them on set to discuss how this um, advice had um, helped them uh, 
change their family life, uh, what had been working or not. Um, and so we're really hoping it will help um, spark a nationwide dialogue on, on parenting. Uh, and here again, I wanted to show you a quick one of the trailer of, of the program. Um, the, the, uh, the subtitling is not entirely uh, timed properly, so I apologize for that, but I hope that will give you a bit of a taster anyway. اليوم نمشيو في لقاء مع فتحي مع جليلة مع أبنائهم الزوز اللي هما لجين ومحمد رست ما كتمش عليه قبل شن شنتوما هو العارف موجود بالطبيعة بالطبيعة هو ما نشعر بعد شوية هكذا شوية احتياط مصغر عايشين معنا بالطبيعة غير مش ما دونك تعاقبوا زيدا بالضرب وقت اللي يعملوا حاجه وانتو ما عليش تضربوهم شنو هما الاسباب اللي خلوا لي 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 ضرب نتاع حاجه خفيفه مش هكا هكا شعل شعل نتاع حاجه مش ضرب ضرب حتى ساعات الخوف هكا بالشيك هكا 88.1% من الأطفال بين 1 و 14 سنة تعرضوا لطرق تأديب عنيفة 21% من الأولياء يعتقدوا أن العقاب الجسدي لازم لتربية الأطفال حاجة مهمة حكيوا عليها الوالدين إنهم يعاقبوا صغارهم ساعات بالضرب ولا بالتهديد بالضرب ويقعد ديما هذا عنف um, so yeah, so this was basically just uh, one of the little trailer of, of the program. Um, and now we're just going into our monitoring and evaluation phase. So I hope it can contribute to potentially one of the further systematic literature review. Um, we are doing mainly a process evaluation um, as we've, we've been looking at uh, utilizing only evidence-based approaches that have already been successful in other contexts from an outcome perspective. Um, and I think we, we, we're fairly confident that we know at this stage what can change parents' behaviors. Uh, what we're less certain about is, is how to engage meaningfully in national and local ecosystem to um, operationalize those interventions in, in, other, in other settings. Um, and I thought I was to finish with um, what does this mean for, for child protection practitioners? Uh, and I think that's something I want to open up the conversation on as well. Um, I think for us, most thing we found that SBC, social and behavioral change approaches, um, anchored in the behavioral driver model, which is a model we utilize for all of our analysis and, and design, uh, appear to be a fairly efficient model to capture the complexities around parenting intervention um, and make sure that we can um, address the challenges in a holistic manner. Um, We've learned also, obviously, that engaging in system change work uh, for parenting services require consistent engagement um, and deep understanding of governance and political economy at, at local and national levels, uh, which I think was really one of the, um, of the key um, element uh, and potentially one of the most positive outcome, but also one of the most challenging one throughout the program. Uh, and really that collaboration is, is absolutely key. Um, for us mobilizing um, stakeholders um, throughout all of government, but also the private sector as a media um, at community level uh, to get everyone on board in a cross-sectoral approach uh, was absolutely, um, absolutely key. Um, and I really hope we'll be able to share very, uh, very soon um, some of the key results of, um, of those interventions. Um, yeah, thank you. So guys so much uh, and I look forward to uh, discussing further during uh, the breakout sessions. Christine, back over to you. Thank you very much, Clement. Yes, your presentation showed how multifaceted the approach is. It's We can see that uh, parenting intervention is not just parent training, yeah, but as you showed us, it is a systemic approach involving various actors, involving different structures and mechanisms. Uh, and only then we can see some changes happening. Thank you very much. And yes, already very interesting questions are coming both for you and Sophia. And let me invite uh, Flora as well for you to see one more um, aspect of uh, parental programming. Flora, please. 
Thank you. And I'm just going to share my screen before I start. And, and I just want to say, not alone. Yes, please introduce uh, with whom you are. Um, before I start, I want to both say thank you for having us. And I think those other presentations were a perfect lead up to ours. Um, I think we're going to highlight some of the things that came up and also reiterate them. And I also want to introduce my colleague, Gary Agaba. He is our project coordinator um, here at TPO Uganda, and we've been implementing this program together. So today we'll be um, talking about caregiver psychosocial programming and preventing harm to children. And I also want to give a special thanks to our funders, USAID. <laughs> And also um, the program developers or REPSI, um, the intervention we use is called Journey of Life and it's been developed by REPSI. Um, TPO Uganda is the implementing organization and Washington University in St. Louis is um, in charge of the research side of this program. Uh, thank you, Flora, for that. And thank you all the participants. Uh, the background of the program, Uganda hosts over 1.4 million refugees and half of that are children. And these children are living in uh, humanitarian settings and face unique vulnerabilities. This intervention aims to enhance uh, caregivers' ability to positively care for themselves and also enhance caregivers' ability to positively care for the children. So the focus of the intervention that we are carrying out, as you can see, we are focusing on the caregivers to be able to have uh, good care about themselves and also focus on giving the same for the children that they are looking after. Sorry for the background noise. Um, so our program is a mix, it's a hybrid effectiveness and implementation design, which means that we're looking both at how you can implement a program in a humanitarian setting and also if this program will be effective. So in order to do that, um, we have like, like um, Sophia kindly explained, um, we have an experimental design where one group receives the intervention and one group does not. They're the control group, although ethically the control group will also receive the intervention after we complete online data collection. Um, so we, we collected qualitative data with key informants to inform how to implement this program effectively. Those key informants included um, community partners, program beneficiaries, and implementation staff. And I'll go into some details about our findings from that at baseline. And we're also doing it at end line to see if anything changed over the course of the intervention, in addition to focus group discussions with children to see the impact on them and the reach of the program. And then we also have quantitative data collection at baseline and end line with both the intervention and the control group. So the people who received it and the people who didn't to see if there was any change based on um, participating in the program. So the Journey of Life program too, I just wanna say a little bit about it. Um, it aims to improve caregiver mental health, um, their caregiver knowledge, and also to support community caregiving. So at the end of the intervention, everyone who's participated, it's a group therapy program. Everyone who's participated in that group comes together to develop a community action plan. So it's not just about their care of their children, but it's also the care of the community's children. So I had a couple of questions. Since you're all practitioners, you probably can answer this pretty well. Um, the first question was, uh, is what do children in humanitarian settings need? And I don't know if we're using Mentimeter for this or just, yeah, we are, okay. Um, so I'll give you a second to fill out the Mentimeter. Just and this picture, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so sorry. I just wanted to say just a reminder that they'll have to do the first question first and then we switch over to the second question. Okay, thank you. And also, um, I just want to highlight this picture um, is from our intervention. So we use a lot of picture codes since most of our participants are pre-literate. Um, so we are able to pass around the pictures and people can sort of see and discuss what, what is happening with the child in the first image and in the second image and what would that child need in order to become big and strong um, as in the second picture of the child. So Katrina, are you going to share the Mentimeter results? Or yeah, that? really, I'm happy to share it. Give me two seconds and I'll bring it up here. It's just going to replace your screen sharing. So you'll have to put it up again afterwards. No problem. Perfect. So there you are. 
Ooh, a word cloud. Okay, so um, it looks like we have education, um, safety, food, routine, peer support, love. This is all really wonderful. And this is pretty much what um, our participants say too. And it's really interesting that when we give the participants the opportunity to say what they think, it also shifts this idea that they only need money, they only need food. Um, they Really, it's about providing like what we have in the center, love, education, safety, um, providing support to those children in whatever way they can. This is great. Um, we can shift to the second question. Yeah, what can parents do to meet those needs? I'll give everyone a minute to fill that out. So for those, it is the same link that was in the chat. If you have it open, if you just refresh, it will now appear as a new question, or if you closed it, you can just click on the same link. Acceptance, nurturing, quality time. Mm -hmm. Modeling, nonviolent problem solving, providing a warm and loving environment, care, attention, and love. These are all so wonderful. Listening, being consistent, asking for support, providing food, safety, psych physical, emotional, and psychological care. Absolutely. Ah, I love this. <laughs> I love seeing what everyone's written in here. A caring environment. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, so there, there are a few exercises that we do throughout. Actually, I'll go back to sharing my screen if it's possible. Um, So there are a few exercises. Um, can you see it? Can everyone see that? Okay, it's looking weird to me for some reason. I was gonna okay, say, there. I think I think it's oh, there it goes. Never mind. It was cutting out a bit of it, but it's all good now. Okay, great. Um, so there are a few exercises that we do throughout the program where we talk about all of these things and give caregivers the opportunity to think about um, different ways that they can support children and different ways they were supported um, that they found useful. Well, I'll share some of the challenges that we have faced. Uh, COVID-19, the pandemic has really been, uh, has affected us, especially the lockdown. It has affected the number of groups we can run. Uh, Journey of Life is supposed to have a number of participants per group. So we reduced the groups to about uh, 10 people, but also the number of sessions reduced because of the lockdown. When the lockdown, we had to stop some activities then come back. Uh, so COVID had that impact. And then also a lot of mental health related uh, issues started coming out. We're facing issues to do with suicide, we're facing different challenges. So as we're dealing with the journey of life, trying to implement the intervention, we also had to find ways of coping with these new challenges that had, had come up uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, then we have different languages that are spoken in the settlement that we are in. Uh, we have four major languages, that's Juba Arabic, uh, Choli, Nyura, and Dinka. But we got to realize that there are many more other languages that come up and then it becomes difficult to group the participants because uh, ideally what a journey of life group has is a social worker with a translator. So in a group, if you have two Arabic and three Dinkas and four Neuras, it will have an impact in terms of how you run the group. So uh, that was also a challenge we faced, I could say. Then I think uh, Sophie talked about this, uh, the mental health and caregiving due to lack of enough evidence. And hopefully by the end of our study or our research, we'll have more information on this, but we combine the section of, of mental health in, in what we're trying to do. So that was saying that for the caregivers, their mental health must be in a certain position for them to be able to give care to the children. So we combined a section of that in our journey of life uh, implementation. And by the end of the research, we'll be able to know uh, how effective it was or what components of that really brought about a positive impact in our implementation. We actually borrowed from um, Problem Management Plus, PM Plus and Inspire, and then we added it to Journey of Life. 
So some qualitative findings from those key informant interviews I discussed, and I separated these into the outer setting, the inner setting, and program components. So in the outer setting, we see what does it take to implement a caregiver psychosocial support program within a humanitarian context? And it's important to look at what are the community needs, what are the resources, who are the leaders in this community, and what are the characteristics within the particular cultures within this community? Um, how is information distributed? For example, in our settlement, um, the network is quite poor, so it's hard to even call our um, social workers or our data collectors or anyone who's in the field or our participants to come to our meetings. Um, what are the political factors? Who do we need to talk to before we can even implement anything? And what are the funding sources and how is funding allocated? For the inner setting, we're looking at organizational climate. So people were talking about things within the organization that either help them or hinder their ability to implement programs. So what contributes to staff motivation? Um, for example, training and supervision opportunities for growth was really important to our staff. Um, and then program specific compo components. Much of this was gotten from conversations with our beneficiaries where they said that, um, for example, were they interested in mixed gender groups or not? Um, were they interested in, for our program, it's a community parenting program. So we were thinking about involving people of different sort of levels within the, the community, community leaders, church leaders, teachers, not just the everyday caregiver, right? So a conversation about if people would even be comfortable with that, would they be comfortable talking with someone who has more power than them in the community? Um, and would the people with more power be even interested in attending a 12 session intervention when they have other things going on? We talked about timing, when we should run groups um, and what, what day of the week, what time, things that got in our way, like food distribution where everyone's going to food distribution and then we can't run any programs that week. Um, where we should run the programs, what's comfortable for people, how do we engage people, and then also the languages um, was a big component that we had to unpack and figure out how to group people based on their languages. These are baseline quant quantitative findings. We're actually just starting endline data collection today, so I can just share the baseline. Um, we surveyed uh, 1,320 people. Um, that's about, um, it was about 650 per each side, treatment and control. Um, and these are just some of the basic findings. So 45% said they experienced severe psychological distress, according to the Kessler. 44% um, experienced impairs in functioning, according to the HUDAS. Um, and functioning was, um, do you have difficulty standing for a long period of time or walking a long distance? Um, and then we also had social support, according to the MOS social support scale. And social support is like, do you have someone to take you to the doctor? Do you have someone to take care of you if you're stuck in bed? Do you have someone to confide in about something that's challenging for you? And um, we thought this was important because it's a psychosocial intervention, right? So we're not just looking at their own mental health, but also how they support each other and how they feel supported. 70% endorsed excessive physical discipline. And when I talk about physical discipline, I'm talking about beating, caning, um, any sort of physical discipline of a child for a range of behaviors. Like if a child um, wet the bed or if they didn't take care of their younger siblings or if they talked back to their parent. Um, so most of them endorse uh, beating a child for any of those circumstances. 20% had behaviors um, that were rejecting children. This is according to the parenting acceptance and rejection questionnaire. So we talk about accepting and rejection. Um, behaviors like I make my child feel like I'm unloved or like they're unloved, or I make my child um, feel loved, right? Either direction. And so 20% um, said that they had behaviors that were sort of rejecting of the child. And then 71% said they experienced some form of intimate partner violence. Um, and by intimate partner violence, I'm talking about a range of insulting and humiliating to um, physically hurting to even using a weapon or um, sexual coercion or um, forcing a partner to do something they don't want to do. So these are all the things that we found at baseline and we're going to see if these things change over the course of the intervention. Uh, some of the major lessons that we learned, uh, one, it's important to understand uh, experiences of the refugees and tell our interventions. Most uh, interventions just come uh, already tailored and they believe that this will, will work. So we are realizing that as we discussed with them and carried our research, 
were able to find out uh, what would work for them best. So we don't just come and say, this is what I, this is what I want to do in the community, this is our intervention and we think it will work for you. So when we take time to find out from them and involve them, then it will be able to be a successful intervention. Uh, we also realized that uh, beneficiaries were excited about the program, especially during the lockdown. Uh, since it was focusing on, on, on caregivers and children, we had a component where they actually even had to bring the children uh, for one session. So they're excited about it because the children have been uh, locked down and they're not in the schools. So they had something to do and keep them active and also learn other skills uh, through the journey of life that they can use as caregivers as we're improving those skills. We also realize it's very important to involve community leaders. If you want to have a successful in intervention or implementation, it's good to involve the community leaders. There are different structures in the humanitarian setting. Here in Kiliandongo, we have what we call the Rasi leaders, we have the religious leaders, we have the elderly, we have the traditional leaders. So it was very important to involve them, for them to give, give the program a blessing. So we involve them from the word go, we inform them about the activity, and some of them actually join some of the journey of life groups, which makes it very, very uh, cooperative. We also realize that communities, when they come together, and work together, they can plan better. We have seen some groups form uh, associations whereby they, they share with each other, for example, food, they share with each other money, they do some savings like soap. When they have soap in their groups, they collect soap among each other and they're able to help uh, different group members with different challenges. One may not have food and they may have a part, some food which they have saved up and then they can give that uh, participant of the group. So with soap and also with money, they save and they start what they call income generating activities. And these activities help them generate some money that can help them their day-to-day -day, uh, challenges. Also working together, they're able to parent, to co-parent in the community because now they are aware of what it means to be uh, an effective uh, caregiver. So if a parent sees a child across in a situation that will put them in what we call the road of danger, they can say, no, that's not right, because they all now can co-parent and help all the children in the community. That's everything. So if you need to contact me, this is just my contact information. Thank okay, you. just to put it out there, we are both vaccinated uh, for COVID, fully vaccinated, and we actually do regular tests. So we have not been able to have the social distance in this presentation and wearing our masks. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren Gary. Thank you for the presentation and thanks for um, emphasizing a lot of different moments, including the engagement with the community, wider community, not just um, working with parental group and to looking at the links um, you know, with the community leaders. Thank you very much. And yes, you also have questions. So um, uh, bear with me as uh, I um, try to manage all these wonderful questions. And sorry, guys, if we uh, uh, won't be able to answer all your questions that we have, but we will try to go um, one by one. I'm sorry for background noise. Somebody is coming with their day-to-day -day activities. So my first question um, will go to um, uh, Sophia, please. Um, um, so the question from Marco that we've got for you, Sophia, is if at the end of the day, child maltreatment has not decreased, would you conclude the preventive impact of parenting intervention is not effective? Or it is a matter that this has not been researched enough? What do you think about this question, Sophia? Yeah, first of all, thank you all for your amazing questions. If you cannot come to all of yours, please send me an email. I would love to be in touch with you. I have all the answers written down. So do, do not hesitate to contact me. Um, Marco, I think that's a brilliant question and I'm really happy that you brought it up because I don't want that this is a take home message from my presentation that um, with parenting interventions, we cannot decrease child maltreatment. The method of the systematic view comes with a lot of pro and cons. And I think one of the cons is the way how we group certain outcomes. And what we have found is that there's a decrease in harsh parenting generally. And when I looked again at my Excel sheet with all the and my uh, data files, 
What I found is that half of the outcomes that are included in harsh parenting actually are abuse items. Um, including are also items such as spanking, harsh parenting, which I would define as child for treatment, but the research field in parenting literature is a bit divided. They like to call these behaviors more harsh parenting, where I am currently moving more towards calling these out as child maltreatment. That's number one. But number two is also that the analysis that included child maltreatment alone was only based on seven studies. This is sufficient to have a robust, significant value, but any aggregate level analysis, so anything that goes on average, is just as good as what is fed into it. And I think we just need more studies to really understand this. Um, so these studies did measure some form of child maltreatment, and this analysis did not have a significant effect, but on average, there was a decrease. So it's all pointing towards the right direction, but I'm really hesitant to say, no, they don't work to reduce child for child maltreatment. Specifically, if we look at all the other reviews we've done in the team, so we looked at all the low middle income country parenting interventions out there. So we included over 100 of studies, and there we see that um, also child maltreatment and some subtypes can be reduced. So um, I think it's a really important question. Um, if we just look at the systematic review finding and don't put any meat to the bone, yes, it does not reduce, but I think if we go more into depth and unpack it a bit more, I think it's really promising that it does reduce child maltreatment. Thank you, Sophia. Um, yeah, Clement, maybe one question for you on the big list of questions we have. So, um, Question for you um, uh, from Cho Lei, and um, it is about um, if some communities, mothers are not going out to participate due to their culture. Yeah, uh, how do did you encourage and engage with parents, particularly during pandemic? And also, it was uh, encouraging to see fathers involved. And how do you handle? the participation of others as well, because we know that in many parental programs, participation of others uh, is, really is really challenging. Yeah, thanks. And it's a um, really great question. And I know through the father and mother engagement question coming up quite, um, quite a few times. So happy to, to touch on that a bit more. Um, I think in, in Tunisia, um, it's less of a conservative culture actually than other cultures. So we, we had less of a struggle on engaging the mother specifically around parenting interventions. Um, however, when we designed the kind of like mother-child play group, so when we designed the play group, they were mother-led play group and then they were father-led play group. We didn't have them mix. And the idea was also to create that safe space for women to be able to meet and interact um, in a socially acceptable setting in a culture where women, if it's not around like at work uh, or family gathering, don't really have any reasons or limited reasons to be associating, right, and sharing experience. Um, and so often what we found is that very often then you always have the same um, kind of experience being shared often by the mother-in-law, uh, by, by family, um, who tend to um, not be as open-minded maybe in terms of discussing some of those parenting issues. Um, and then in terms of engaging father, I think um, there's a number of things we, we try to do, um, not all successful, but hopefully some of them. Um, I mean, first of all, I think, and I, I hope that was clear through the presentation, but I think we took a very firm stance uh, in just the, the visual aspect of the program uh, to make sure that it was very non-gendered in that matter. Uh, and it has been it's through a lot of discussions uh, and a lot of consultation on, on what the look and feel of this program would be and actually humor uh, and this humoristic approach was deemed the most appropriate in a way and the one that would most likely um, get male caregivers to be willing to engage in the program and to be interested in engaging in the program. Um, but then also when we set up our local interventions, 
um, we we went throughout each of our four kind of like broader communities um, and the thing that, like we basically co-identified with the communities uh, reference for focal points for the C4D to so the communication for development program and then for the parenting group. Uh, and for instance, in Baltabuawen in North uh, Eastern Tunisia, which is actually very rural um, and quite um, and quite remote, uh, the local barber um, was the one who was a designated by the whole community to be the parenting focal point. Uh, and obviously he engages much more with men than is with women um, by the nature of his, of his job. Um, and so that was really instrumental in, in getting fathers um, engaged. Um, and I think to the other point, I think you mentioned Christina was going back a bit with, on how this was piloted during during pandemic. And I think Flora and Gary had also a few, a few, a few interesting points on that. Um, I mean, we adapted a lot, it was all very iterative. Um, we literally run into nightmare situations with, you know, um, parents dropping out constantly, lockdown being announced uh, the day before an activity. Um, and so we try to do a lot of phone mobilization. Um, we remain in constant um, contact with people. Um, we also did a lot of those like little like videos that we could share on um, on WhatsApp. Um, we tried to do, we gathered people in common locations uh, where they could all have access. For instance, in one of the locations, the culture house or cultural center rather was as a, as a reference site for the program. Um, so they would host every couple of weeks, they would host a session where they'd get like good access to internet and with like physical distancing and, and mask wearing, uh, they would bring everyone into the room to make sure that there was like high quality remote training sessions so that we wouldn't interrupt the program for too long. Um, and all in all, that's something we're actually like, we're collating all of this as part of our process evaluation to really um, document it in a, in, a, in a bit of a more systematic manner. And also I think it's gonna be very useful. The next three months are really about kind of like reflection and how can we scale up and, and lessons learned. Um, and I think that getting a bit of perspective on all of those things we did quite in a hurry, to be honest, in terms of trying to adapt to a pandemic that no one had anticipated. Um, I'm hoping we'll be able to have some, some very good reflection on that that we can share with the broader community as well. Thanks, Clement. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, one more question for you, Flora. Gary, um, yes, we agree that the um, role of uh, community leaders is important. Uh, our colleagues are asking, uh, can you bring an example how instrumental were, were the uh, community leaders? What specifically they did to support the program that was really helpful for your intervention? Uh, well, uh, the community leaders played a major role in uh, mobilizing. They are able to identify the community participants and when they call them for activities, they tend to respond uh, for these activities. Uh, where we had community leaders in the groups that were running the journey of life, attendance was full because uh, the leaders would help in the mobilization for the sessions and we were able to get uh, the participants to attend. And also leaders identify for us areas where we can have our journey of life implemented, where we will not have any challenges in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the setting. They know which venues we can use, they know which areas we can go to, because sometimes the there are some tribal uh, conflicts and you might go to a place whereby, the, 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 for example, the Dinka may not want to work where the Neura are, but when you have the community leaders, they're able to help us with those structures. But their major role was in mobilization and identifying uh, participants. When you have them uh, doing that, then you're easy to, to go, to, give, to have a go ahead in what you're trying to implement. There are other networks we work with too, like um, there are different working groups in the settlement that we work with and even like mobilizing to get more materials for our um, participants, getting masks, getting things for our um, staff who are implementing things like that. Those really came through from the COVID working group and through different working groups in the settlement as well. 
Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and yes, we're almost uh, finishing with our session, but just Sophia to ask um, um, one more question. Hamid was asking if um, when you were doing your systematic review, were you looking also at um, a livelihoods related interventions and any financial support that parents were giving as part of their parental um, uh, programming or not? Yeah, this is a really good question. So we did include two studies that um, focused on economic strengthening of families. So uh, one study, so I, I will need to look at the name of the authors, but one study is from Rwanda and the other one is from Burkina Faso. And one study looked at um, the difference between a parenting intervention as the intervention group and economic strengthening as a control group. And the other trial um, gave to both groups an economic strengthening, but just wanted to understand whether an addition of parenting components in form of a small parenting intervention made a difference. So I can't summarize by heart the findings of these two studies. So I'm happy to share them with you. Um, so please just um, write me a short email. Um, but definitely the field is acknowledging the need to, to take into account the other aspects of INSPIRE, to not only look at parenting, but I also know of another one from my department an economic strengthening intervention, for example, in Tanzania. So there are various aspects, but also various outcomes with some even maybe in, in, um, increasing a bit of harm. So it's, it's still something we need to unpack and to understand a bit further. So yes, there are the studies, but I'm not an expert in this specific niche. So I'm happy to just forward you those studies. Thank you very much, our dear presenters. Um, and um, yeah, I specifically got a lot of insights from all of you. Um, yes, if you can share your contact details, I think you will be getting a lot of uh, emails from different people uh, wanting to get more of your experience please share um, and um, yeah, please let's continue conversation um, on another platform because as we exchange, I think we get stronger in the areas that we each one of us work with. I'm very thankful for your active participation. Sorry we couldn't answer all your questions, but I hope this will be the start of our conversation that we will continue. Thanks again, and I am very happy that I was part of this group. Mm -hmm.